Cyberpunk 2077 isn't perfect. It has issues. It has a lot of issues. Bugs, broken features, broken promises, and a general feeling that the game is unfinished. But these issues only make up a minority of the game depending on the version you play. On older consoles, Cyberpunk was a disaster, and it was a buggy mess, and I am sorry if you played that version. But for me, and I genuinely feel guilty saying this, playing on the Xbox Series X was a completely different experience. It wasn't a buggy mess, and it was nowhere near a disaster. There were, of course, bugs. Finally someone I can fucking fight! But there's also so much more that's already great. And while it would be easy to sit here and pick apart the gameplay, Yes, the gameplay is like Skyrim, and yes, it's arguably shallow. If we were to do that, we would be completely missing the point, because that's not what CD Projekt Red are good at. What is it we love about The Witcher 3, for example? For me, it's not the gameplay. Hunting monsters is great, and sailing across the seas of Skellige is one of my favourite gaming moments of all time. But that's not why The Witcher is special. It's special because of the characters, the sprawling quest lines, the mature narrative, and the open world. And in Cyberpunk, it's exactly the same. Because the best moments aren't grinding activities and levelling up, it's simply sitting there, taking in the world, and getting to know each character. So, if you expected Cyberpunk to introduce revolutionary game mechanics, you will unfortunately be disappointed. But if you're here to experience what CDPR are great at, you will, like I did, really, really enjoy this game. Now, let me try to convince you why it might be time to reconsider Cyberpunk, and why it might be time to give it one more shot. I'm Twin Six, and this is my review of Cyberpunk 2077. As you've guessed from the title of Cyberpunk, the year is 2077, and we're in Night City, California. Night City is completely fictional, but it's based on real-world locations like Morro Bay. But for me, living in the cold climates of the UK and unfamiliar with the geography of California, it seemed like LA, especially with wealthy areas on the pristine pavements of Corpo Plaza and the deprived areas on the outskirts with single-storey housing in Santo Domingo. Corporations control the world with a private army, atrocious working conditions, and a complete disregard for the environment around us. To them, we're just customers, and we're bombarded with advertisements on billboards, aircrafts, and even on street corners, with a TV channel devoted entirely to just ads. This message of corporate greed and the resulting negative effect has been said many times before, and cyberpunk doesn't really add that much. But this message is still important in the modern world. We have social media companies, we're the richest companies in history, and we're already on the way to an environmental disaster. Night City is one of the most visually interesting open worlds in recent memory, and seeing it all is one of the best things about cyberpunk going inside these futuristic, neon-lit buildings, or walking down city streets and admiring the artistry on show. I was constantly blown away by the amount of effort that went into designing this world, how the buildings fit together, how there were different vertical levels, and most impressively, how Night City felt like a maze. The waypoint system is too handholdy in Cyberpunk, but to navigate through the world, it is absolutely essential. The different areas of Night City also make sure everything is visually interesting, with many areas using environmental storytelling, in Santo Domingo, there's a fallen ferris wheel which lies dormant in the square, which not only shows us that the area is in disrepair, but it highlights deeper social issues in Night City. These people have been abandoned, and as a result, the local Sixth Street gang have taken over. They stand watch on the corner, and the sounds of gunshots ring out in the distance. And in the old tourism district of Pacifica, there are slums on the streets, and the theme park remains unused. Moments like this are everywhere, that not only create interesting locations to explore, but use subtle world building to flesh out Night City. While these urban areas are impressive, one of the best areas is found when leaving city limits and entering the surrounding deserts of the Badlands. The Badlands was completely different from everything else in the game, both visually and in design. Its barren landscape is huge, with so much to find, and it challenges us to use off-road vehicles to get around. And considering how suffocating Night City can be, exploring the Badlands was especially refreshing. I have so many great memories here, rounding up criminal gangs while listening to jazz on the radio, or even stumbling across a giant solar array in the south of the desert. But whether we're exploring the Badlands or the city centre, Night City feels real. I usually felt immersed in everything I was doing, and I think the reason for this is due to the audio design and the NPCs. 
Now, the NPCs do have issues, which I will discuss, but first, let's start with the audio. The audio in many open world games is unnaturally quiet, to the point where it's obvious we're playing a game. Look at Watch Dogs Legion for example. Legion is set in London, one of the busiest cities in the world, and was released a month before Cyberpunk. The world in Legion is quiet, there's rarely any realistic background noise, and you can even hear birds tweeting in the centre of London. Compare this to Cyberpunk, where we have people chatting, city-wide announcements, and the sounds of aircraft flying overhead. It all feels realistic. Let's listen now, and you'll see what I mean. Second up are the NPCs. The population density is the highest we've seen in a video game to date. And I know it's not as high as we were showed in the previews, but it's still impressive compared to other open world games. NPCs also act in realistic ways to immerse us further. They play arcade machines, listen to preachers, eat at food stalls, report the news, protest outside corporate buildings, attend Tai Chi classes, commit crimes, work out, and occasionally, the Night City Police are on the street investigating a crime scene. All of these tiny moments are animated realistically to immerse us further. Look at this character called Gary the Prophet. He is so well animated. This is one NPC, but examples are everywhere, like people flicking cigarettes away mid-conversation, or as NPCs play the guitar note for note. I should point out this NPC did not play the guitar note for note another time. He wasn't even singing the correct words. It was very odd. But the most impressive parts of Night City are its interior spaces. Inside a nightclub, there are people dancing to a DJ or taking a breather in a nearby alley, whereas restaurants have people eating at tables or just sat around relaxing. The interior spaces were that impressive that I'd usually walk into a place and stop in my tracks, in awe at the sheer number of NPCs in the room, all acting in realistic ways. In these moments, when the audio and realistic NPCs combine, it feels like Cyberpunk is firing on all cylinders and the promise of the most immersive game ever made is close to being fulfilled. But this praise for the open world is unfortunately only half of the story, because all of these details are superficial. They're only on the surface, designed to impress us as we pass by for a brief moment. Because if we stop for more than a second, the cracks appear and the immersion shatters. People don't move away once the preacher has finished speaking, and crowds in nightclubs are going full throttle even during quiet parts of the song. The first time I noticed this issue was when we meet Takemura in a cafe. We walk in and there's a waitress taking orders and people sat at the bar. We sit down and everything plays out in the background. This is great, but as time goes by, it's clear the NPCs are stuck on a loop. The waitress walks between tables taking orders, some with people still eating at, and scribbles on a notepad without ever moving a mouth. And the man directly behind us eats a burger, yet the burger remains intact. The initial impression was fake and the immersion was shattered. The main problem is that the open world is unfinished. I mean, the evidence is everywhere. Sometimes NPCs materialise out of thin air or stand there frozen in time once they've finished their pre-scripted lines of dialogue. Cars aren't programmed to drive around obstructions, so if you park your car in the road, traffic quickly builds up behind you. And the wanted system is still completely broken. If you break the law, 20 police officers spawn behind you and immediately gun you down. It's such a shame because having police chases is one of the best things about these types of games, but in Cyberpunk, it's just not an option. When you leave Night City, the quality is also questionable, as there were multiple times the roads were empty of cars. I suppose this is realistic, as the outskirts of cities are quiet, but when you look at Night City from a distance, there are cars everywhere, so this is either a bug or it's unfinished. It's always clear what CDPR are going for, with an impressive amount of detail in certain areas but these moments always fall flat. Whether this is due to bugs or because CDPR ran out of time isn't clear, but it highlights how Cyberpunk has failed to live up to its full potential. To me, this was frustrating, but due to the quality in the rest of the game, it wasn't enough to rule Cyberpunk a failure, because the narrative emissions are already that good that they are enough to warrant Cyberpunk a success. Need a smoke, where'd you stash yours?
The main missions follow the basic structure of remove Johnny Silverhand from your head. Johnny is a terrorist from 50 years ago whose consciousness is implanted on a biochip which now resides in our brain. Over time Johnny's consciousness is replacing our own and we need to remove the chip before he takes over completely. At first Johnny is a dick, he's filled with rage and speaks to people like shit, including his girlfriend as well as V. It's clear we don't want to work with him, his suggestions fall on deaf ears and we want him gone for good. But the more time we spend together, the more we learn about him. He talks about his past with regret, wishing things were different, and even tries to make amends with people in his life. As a result we see different parts of his personality, all told through hundreds of lines of dialogue over many many hours. There's even a meter which fills depending on this bond. Ultimately, it's our choice whether we allow Johnny to affect our decisions, or even if we let him take over completely. Later on CDPR gives you Johnny's old clothes if you want to truly embody him here. This constant battle between Johnny and V, between resistance and acceptance, plays out before us. But in the moment, we're unaware it's even happening. After all, the function of the meter is never outright explained. But there's one line of dialogue in the game's final act that made me rethink the entire game. As Misty says, Every minute of every day, we each become someone new. We shouldn't fear change itself, but only who we might change into. Knowing one's path is most important. When I heard this line, it felt like the rug had been pulled from beneath me, and all of the conversations with Johnny had new meaning. The time I disagreed with Johnny, now realising I should have listened, or the many times I ignored him when he was only trying to help. It felt like every conversation we had matters, and it shows us that sometimes change can be good. The subtle way the narrative and themes are told treats us with respect and intelligence, as nothing is ever outright explained. As we're told Johnny's story, we're shown interactive flashback sequences. We have no idea what's happening, as his bandmate tells him he doesn't have to do this, before we're on board a helicopter and then planting a bomb in an elevator. But just as we gradually learn more about Johnny's personality, we gradually learn more about the narrative. More flashback sequences show Johnny's girlfriend be kidnapped and used to test the original biochip. In the process, like Johnny, Alt's body was lost and now she lives on in AI form. From this it's clear why Johnny acts the way he does. He wants revenge against Arasaka for their role in Alt's death. And now, using V as a vessel, he can do just that. I mean, compare this to so many other games that would use a generic cutscene to ram everything down your throat in one go. The state of the world, what your role is, or the events that got you here. Cyberpunk never does this, and I think it deserves praise for its success in this area. The missions and narrative aren't just great because of the way they're being told. They're also great because of the way we experience them. There's a famous phrase from legendary film director Alfred Hitchcock, who says, Suspense doesn't come from a bomb exploding beneath a table. Suspense comes from a bomb beneath a table, and knowing at any second it could explode. In Inglorious Bastards, Tarantino uses this technique as we see a group of American soldiers infiltrating a basement full of Nazis, played out over 20 minutes. As each minute passes, suspense rises where the bomb, or Nazis, could explode at any minute. In Cyberpunk, CDPR uses this technique in exactly the same way and to exactly the same effect. For example, when we're trying to steal from the head of the powerful Arasaka Corporation, the CEO returns and we're forced to hide in the wall, wait and be silent. Just like the Nazi soldiers, the CEO is the bomb and if we make one wrong move, it could explode at any moment. Before this point, the point where the bomb is about to explode, there have been hours of preparation, discussing the job or using brain dance to scope out an area. This is a key reason why the main missions are engaging. They're tense in the moment due to the suspense, but our objectives feel important due to the slow build-up. During a city-wide parade, we know our role to eliminate the watching snipers is important, because we need to give Takemura a safe window to jump on board the float. And if we fail, Takemura's life may be in danger. But because we've spent the last three hours getting to know him, we're invested in this character, we want the mission to be a success and we don't want Takemura to die. This mission was also great because of the spectacle, as huge holographic dragons fly past in the background. Compare this to other mainstream games, where our mission objective is delivered in the most generic way. A loading screen, a quick cutscene, or even told to us over comms as we work through the mission. These methods are ineffective as we rarely feel invested in what we're doing, but CDPR understands this, and they've built upon it to elevate their missions to incredible heights. The moments where CDPR are at the helm, guiding us through the missions, must be experienced first hand. 
However, we have to ask how much was sacrificed for these scripted sequences, and when it comes to the RPG mechanics, quite a lot actually. In every playthrough, everyone must end up at the same point. We must be here with Jackie when time runs out, the CEO returns and we hide in the wall, and the only way to achieve this is to have the majority of the main missions on rails. They are fun rails to be on, but they're still rails. Which brings us nicely to the biggest point of contention in Cyberpunk. Is Cyberpunk actually an RPG? Well, this depends on how we define RPGs. For me, an RPG is a game where you roleplay as a character with skills that tie into your role. If I'm playing as a thief, I'll focus on stealth, or for a mage, I'll focus on magic. Having this choice is a start, but being an RPG also means choices in dialogue, and ultimately, choices that affect the world around us. In great RPGs like Wasteland 3, we see the consequences of our actions play out in the world. If we choose not to work with a faction, they'll refuse to trade with us, or if we wipe them out completely, they're gone forever. So, under this definition, yes, Cyberpunk is an RPG. Just. You play a role as there are three classes to choose from, Corpo, Street Kid or Nomad, which all have dialogue options that tie into your role. As a Nomad, these options allowed me to interact with other Nomad clans, and comment on Night City's way of life from the view of an outsider. The sheer number of dialogue options was enough to convince me that I was, in fact, a Nomad. I always felt like the role I was playing. There's also a large skill set with branching perk trees to customise your role further. If you want to be a sniper, you can focus on bonus headshot damage for example. Outside of combat, these skills help you navigate through the world, which is another staple of a good RPG. There's loads of different options like this for every skill in Cyberpunk. This means the repeat playthroughs will vary depending on your role. But, and this is one of the reasons Cyberpunk is only just an RPG, it's only just role-playing. We can't play as a unique character, as we're always V. And I don't mean my V, I mean the V we've been shown in promotional material. This V. V the voice protagonist, the hard ass with a grizzled voice like he's auditioning for the next Batman film. Shut your trap if you don't want to eat lead. This is always an issue in RPGs with voice protagonists, as it's hard to separate the role we're playing from the person we're seeing, or in this case, hearing. It's exactly the same in Mass Effect, where I never felt like my own character, I was always the Commander Shepard Bioware had created. But in Cyberpunk, this issue is much worse due to the constant first person perspective. As we never see our character outside of menus or on motorbikes, it makes it difficult to separate this V from our V. You can look in the mirror, sure, but there's no reason to. And I'm not suggesting there should be a third person camera, as the first person perspective is designed to immerse us. But more could have been done to make us feel like our character. We could see our reflection in car windows, or have clothes shops with changing rooms in a mirror when we buy clothes. There's also a larger issue that makes Cyberpunk only just an RPG, as we are rarely given any meaningful choice. We have branching dialogue trees, but usually every option ends up at the same point, like one time I tried to romance Pan Am. I made a move which backfired, it was awkward, and it was really cringy. So I reloaded the save and tried a more subtle approach. But the next time we spoke, her dialogue was exactly the same, no matter which option I selected. We were given a choice, but the endpoint is always the same. There are no consequences to our actions. RPGs are at their best when we're forced to make tough choices, and if we mess up, we're made to feel guilty. What you don't do is have a character text you if your decision ruined their life. It doesn't work, as we never see the consequences play out in real time. This lack of consequence is at its worst in the main missions, where we're mainly on rails. But in other areas of cyberpunk, mainly in the side missions, there are actual RPG choices. There was an outstanding moment in a Maelstrom nightclub where the bouncers recognised me due to my actions earlier in the game. Fuck. No fucking way! Remember that tank from All Foods? That's the Jumu did Royce! No, 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 wouldn't be that stupid to show up here! And there are other choices where our actions even cause people to die. If we kill this doctor, for example, we never learn of a virus uploaded onto the kidney we're collecting. If the kidney is installed with the virus on, the person we're trying to save is gone forever. And this is why Cyberpunk is an RPG, as there are consequences to our actions, and we can roleplay. But it's only just an RPG, because they are always on the smallest of scales. The RPG mechanics I've just described happened after 40 hours of gameplay, and I worry that people who are dismissing the game haven't seen this. Because if you play through the main questline, which takes around 20 hours, and let's say another 10 hours running side content, you'd think the RPG mechanics aren't there. But they are. They're lacking in the main missions, sure, but the side content is full of them. 
New side missions we're even unlocking after 55 hours of gameplay. Side missions that are so good, they are some of my favourites in gaming. Since, well, since The Witcher 3. The side missions compared to the main are a completely different beast altogether. It's almost as if the main missions are an appetizer that introduced us to key characters in Night City, and the side missions are the main course, where we learn more about each character and more about Night City. We meet Judy in the main missions, but it's not until we scuba dive to a flooded hometown that we get to know her properly. We meet Claire in the main missions, but it's not until we win a racing tournament and avenge her husband's death that we get to know her properly. And we meet Pan Am in the main missions, but it's not until we help her make amends with her clan that we get to know her properly. And this is really the best part of the side missions, and arguably the entire game. Taking it slow, kicking back, and getting to know each character. Sitting around a campfire with Pan Am's clan and raising a toast was my favourite moment in Cyberpunk. And if you've told Pan Am about Jackie, she includes his name in the toast, which was a completely unexpected level of detail. The side missions also show an impressive amount of variety, not just in their objectives, but in their tone. Some are light-hearted and comical, as Kerry is furious at a Japanese pop band for covering one of his songs, but it's ultimately heartwarming as he bonds with the band and they accept him like a new family member. Whereas others are extremely dark, like they've been pulled straight from the pages of Frank Miller's Sin City. In one quest, we race against time to save River's nephew from the insidious Peter Pan killer. This mission also used a detailed character study to examine why the killer turned out the way he did. Every side mission starts off simple, but layers are added, turning them into an epic sprawling adventure. If you're not a fan of slow-burning, narrative-driven games, then you might not feel the same way. The side missions are slow paced, some that slow that they involve no combat whatsoever. I never found this tedious though, as there are memorable moments to keep things interesting. One side mission for example, involves getting Johnny's band back together, which was completely unique as you all rock out on stage. The motion capture for each instrument here was jaw dropping, and as a drummer, I can confirm it's 100% accurate. And River's questline, another highlight, finishes with a cookout where you physically stir a pot of jambalaya and fetch rice from the kitchen. How many other mainstream games can offer anything like this? In fact, food is a key part of the cyberpunk experience, and the side missions understand this. Many side missions start or end in a restaurant as we meet characters to grab food and catch up, just like we would with our own friends. And the waitress even walks over to take our order, adding an additional layer of realism, on top of brands like the pizza place Pi Z. Everything is completely believable. The way these characters act, the locations we're visiting, and the tiny details that immerse us in the moment. If we're immersed and we believe everything is real, we will bond with these characters like they are real, which stops these slower moments from ever turning dull. The issue that plagues the open world, which breaks when you put it under a microscope, unfortunately finds its way to the side missions. It's outstanding in the moment, when everything is pre-scripted, but it soon becomes clear the illusion of realistic characters is just that an illusion. Characters often text you for a chat, which is realistic, right? But if you actually follow up on any of these text messages, nothing happens. There's no new dialogue options, almost as if the text doesn't exist. It's an odd decision to develop these characters to this standard, and not use them outside their quest lines. I noticed this the most with Victor. We spend the first 10 hours of the game getting to know him, but the only time I ever saw him again was 40 hours later, when he randomly appeared at a boxing match and then he disappeared again until the very end of the game. Characters play an important role when Cyberpunk concludes, as each one has a section in the credits, but they are so underutilised leading up to this that I forgot some people even existed. Okay, so now I'm going to discuss the endings of the game, which brings us to the point of no return in the review. If you want to avoid spoilers for the ending of Cyberpunk, skip to the time on screen now. Okay, if you're still with me, let's look at each ending in detail. There are five endings in total, but really, only three are worthwhile. The two that aren't involve V committing suicide or dying as he assaults Arasaka alone, which is a big middle finger to anyone who chose them, so let's forget about them. The other three are wildly different from each other. We either side with Arasaka, join forces with Rogue, or convince Pan Am and the Aldecados to stand by our side, although if you haven't completed Pan Am's questline, the last option won't be available. The most impressive thing about the endings is just how much care and attention is given to each one. They're never rushed and play out over two hours like a mini Red Dead Redemption 2 style epilogue. 
Siding with the Aldicados unlocks a mission at their camp the night before we assault Arasaka Tower. Here we can talk to the nomads about the mission, including some poignant exchanges where Pan Am admits she's scared to die. The atmosphere, the dialogue options, and the weight of the mission creates the feeling that we're about to head to war. Everyone's life is in our hands. This mission also uses the Basilisk tank, which feels so good to control I wish it was used more in the game. But more importantly, it's a perfect example of the quality when CDPR are at the helm, guiding us through the story. My heart was in my mouth every time a key character was in danger, especially when we were tricked into thinking Pan Am is dead. Although, it never quite had the impact it should as a bug made sure I spent the final missions with no pants on. Siding with Rogue is a different mission altogether, especially if you let Johnny take over V's body. Rogue and Johnny make amends, which is a satisfying ending to that chapter in his story. A helicopter ride takes us to the 76th floor of Arasaka Tower, which gets shot down in mid-air. Good job our anti-grav boots are on hand to break the fall. Using the boots, we descend Arasaka Tower, floor by floor, in another unique gameplay moment. The Arasaka ending though, the final ending, doesn't quite reach the same heights. The problem doesn't lie with the gameplay, in fact, gate crashing a board meeting that erupts in a shootout is worth experiencing. The problem lies with the lack of interest in its characters. We've only just met Hanako, making it hard to care about her, whereas with Pan Am and Rogue, we've spent hours with them in both the main and side missions. We care what happens to Pan Am, the Aldicados, and Rogue, but we don't for Hanako and Yorinobo, especially as they are only used in the main questline, rather than interweaved across the entire game. However, it's worth experiencing the Arasaka ending, as the epilogue is the best in the game. We wake up in a medical facility, only to find out we are actually in space. We have no idea what's happening, as we complete routine tests. These moments felt a lot like Prey, where nothing is as it first seems. Dream sequences show the dead body of Jackie haunting the hallways, and we try to solve a Rubik's Cube, and this happens. The other epilogues are cliched in principle, as V or Johnny essentially ride off into the sunset, but they never lean too heavily on gimmick. They're presented cinematically with an emotive soundtrack that does each character justice. With Johnny's epilogue, we're introduced to a new character called Steve, and again, due to poor character development, it's hard to engage with Steve. I realise he's here to show us that Johnny has matured, as Johnny acts as a father figure to him, but introducing new characters in the final hour of a game is never a good idea. Every one of the three endings, and their following epilogues, perfectly rounds off Cyberpunk. I just wish they were longer. I want to know what became of Pan Am and V as they head to Arizona, or how Johnny made a new life for himself. And the fact that I'm saying that just shows how good the main missions are and how well these characters are developed. Do I feel as connected with Cyberpunk's characters compared to The Witcher 3? No, I don't. But we have to remember, there have been three Witcher games and huge expansions, we spent more time with Geralt than we have V, so we need to give it time. Okay, so I spent half of the review talking about the open world, the missions, and the characters of Cyberpunk. And now I think it's time we get to another point of contention, the gameplay. Outside of the main and side missions, gameplay consists of a handful of activities, shown on the map as hundreds of markers waiting to be ticked off. It's overwhelming initially, as we're bombarded with text messages and calls to let us know that new missions are available. I think CDPR were following Breath of the Wild's structure here, where the entire map opens up after the introduction. But whereas Breath of the Wild has vast open spaces in between its activities, Cyberpunk is dense in design. The density of Night City means there will often be multiple activities within 100 meters of each other. I have no idea how long it takes to complete them all, but I'd say there's more than 100 hours of content to keep you busy. The activities all follow the same structure, go to a location, complete an objective, and leave. And I myself have criticised this structure in other games. But in Cyberpunk, depth is added on top of this repetitive design. For gigs, we're paid to do a job, eliminate someone, rescue someone, steal something, and so on. It sounds tedious, doesn't it? But it's not, because each gig is set in one of Night City's interesting locations. One might take us into the 7th Hell nightclub, whereas another takes us inside a psychiatric hospital, with great environmental storytelling. The other main activities are NCPD jobs, where you help take down violent gang members. They range from quick bursts of action with four or five enemies to fight, to large outposts similar to Far Cry. 
And just like the gigs, they're set in interesting locations, a motel in the Badlands, or the abandoned theme park at Pacifica, where you can hack the big wheel to distract enemies. And as I said earlier, one of the best things about Cyberpunk is exploring Night City. While these activities make sure we're seeing something new even tens of hours into the game, maybe even more. There are also unique moments outside of this mission structure, which are shown on the map as question marks. Each mission is unique, with some imaginative moments to the point where it's impossible to predict what we'll find at each one. Each one is a mystery waiting to be discovered, and as a result it creates a willingness to explore. I also don't think the design of these activities is supposed to be compelling, rather they're here to let us blow off some steam by taking down some bad guys. The main and side missions are slow paced, with hours of conversations, sometimes as we're a passenger, literally being driven around the city. So if we've spent 4 hours completing a questline, then we might want something different, we might want some action. Well, the activities give us that. Once a questline is wrapped up, we can open the map, find the nearest activity, and within minutes be having fun, levelling up our characters and being rewarded as we do. The reward structure is basically Skyrim, as other people have mentioned. You use a weapon and as a result gain experience in that skill tree, and with every level you get a skill point to spend on perks. The perks are basic, like plus 10% attack damage, although others are more specialised. One perk I had doubled burn damage, which when combined with a fire shotgun, created a satisfying gameplay loop. So you can see this is similar to Skyrim, but saying the gameplay is like Skyrim is the wrong way to look at Cyberpunk because no one is looking at The Witcher 3 and saying it's average because it's like Monster Hunter. Just as no one is looking at The Last of Us and saying it's average because its gameplay is like Gears of War. No, this is the wrong way to look at things. Cyberpunk is similar to Skyrim, but there's so much more. Combat with depth, hacking, stealth, and a surprisingly competent loot game, all of which keep the activities engaging. The loot game is that well established that other games like the recent Marvel's Avengers could learn a lot from Cyberpunk. We have rarities, with rarer gear having more perks, and everything drops at random. This is what makes looters great, the randomness, knowing that at any second a powerful weapon could drop. On top of this, we have iconic weapons that could be upgraded indefinitely. This means, if we find an iconic weapon we like, it stays viable across the entire game. I play a lot of Destiny, and right now Bungie has power capped most weapons making them essentially useless. But that's not an issue in Cyberpunk, as I can upgrade my iconic weapons forever. So we're allowed to keep the guns we like, but this system also pushes us towards crafting. The crafting system is admittedly simple, but it's effective in its goals by adding another layer to the rewards. If an epic weapon drops for example, it can be dismantled for parts, meaning we're one step closer to our next upgrade. And if we're not happy with our current loadout, we can use the parts to craft powerful weapons using blueprints we find in the open world. The crafting system needs work with more accessibility options, but it's already a good start. Outside of these reward structures, the core gameplay also has depth. The first positive is that combat feels good, shooting is satisfying, it feels weighty, impactful and has great sound design. I mean, just listen to this sniper. This sniper feels powerful, and we're shown it's powerful as it can dismember enemies. All enemies react like this when they're shot, further reinforcing the power behind each weapon. The shotguns were so much fun to use because of this, as they knocked enemies to the ground, setting them up for a point blank shot. And at height, we can blast enemies off the edge. But there's also weapon types to customise our playstyle further. Using a tech weapon we can charge up a shot and pierce walls, and smart weapons have an auto lock which sends bullets snaking through the air, sometimes around corners if we plan it right. I suppose most of this is expected for an FPS game, and we have seen it before, but we have to remember this is a first person RPG. If we compare the gunplay to a pure FPS game, then of course it falls short, but compare it to other first person RPGs and the combat is miles above anything else out there. We also have to remember, this is CDPR's first attempt at FPS mechanics. When Bethesda entered the FPS genre in 2008, the shooting was shocking. The shooting in Cyberpunk is nowhere near shocking. And anyway, having more options, even if they're unoriginal, is always a good thing. I mean, Cyberpunk could have been a standard run and gun affair, with no cyberware abilities, no weapon types, and no hacking or stealth. And again, the hacking and stealth are simple, but their inclusion still benefits the game. They allow us to mix up our playstyle by sneaking through an area and entering through the roof, rather than going in all guns blazing. With everything I've just described, the reward structures and the depth of combat with multiple playstyles, gameplay is elevated above the simple structure of go here, do a thing, get out. And I think the reason I feel like this is because I was playing on hard, 
because on hard, enemies can kill us in a few hits, so we're forced to upgrade our gear through crafting. A powerful drop is also exciting, as a legendary weapon with strong perks makes the combat slightly more forgiving. Hacking and stealth are also a must, as we need them to thin out enemy numbers before engaging in combat, or in some cases, avoid combat entirely. But on normal, these systems are optional, just as many of the systems in The Witcher 3 are on lower difficulties. This praise doesn't mean the gameplay is perfect, it's not. There are fundamental issues with enemy AI, boss fights, and the broken checkpoint system. The quality of the AI is sporadic to say the least. Sometimes they'll charge towards you in combat, putting you in uncomfortable situations, but other times they stand out in the open, waiting to be shot. And during stealth, if an enemy starts to detect us, they don't search the area until we've been fully detected. This makes no sense. If you were guarding an area and saw something body shaped move in the shadows, you'd go investigate. Bosses also range on the intelligence scale. Some are idiots, while others are absolute killing machines. The worst bosses came when I was forced to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The melee system is average in Cyberpunk, with weapons generally lacking any real impact. But the hand-to-hand -hand combat is the worst. Look how much damage I'm doing to this boss, it's ridiculous. I even have Gorilla Fist equipped and a high body attribute. I get that boss encounters are tough to design in any shooter, but other developers understand how they should work. We need a big target to shoot at, which moves slowly and gives us time to dodge incoming attacks. What we don't want is a fast-paced melee boss in a first-person game who turns invisible and runs away. All of the bosses were atrocious, except maybe the final one. But this boss, with his katana combo that kills us in a few hits, was so infuriating I almost stopped playing. But the biggest issue is the start of the fight due to the checkpoint system. When I started this fight against a melee-centric boss, I had no melee weapon equipped. My health was also low, meaning I'd die in a few hits as soon as the fight started. My only option was to go into my inventory, swap weapons, and then scramble to heal before engaging the boss. There's a reason From Software have fog screens before an encounter, it's to let us know we need to be ready. Like, can you imagine going up against a demon of hatred with half health and the wrong weapon equipped? <laughs> no, because the developers give us a heads up to let us know shit's about to go down. It's mainly the checkpoint's fault for restarting me as I engaged in combat, which as a one-off is fine, but the checkpoints were frustrating everywhere. In the open world, I'd restart at the end of the last activity rather than at the start of the one I was doing. And remember that incredible moment where we were double-crossed by the Maelstrom? It was ruined by the checkpoint system, which started me again with the wrong weapon equipped with no heads up. I had to reload an older save just to make sure I had a shotgun. Other than these minor frustrations with bosses, checkpoints and dumb AI, the gameplay is solid because of the reward structures, because of exploring Night City, and because the core mechanics are satisfying, even if somewhat unoriginal in design. But even though these parts of Cyberpunk are good, they're not the best parts of the game. The best parts are the narrative, the subtle themes, the way we experience the missions and the characters, the things that are already in the game. I already feel connected to these characters like I do in my favourite RPGs, and certain quests are my favourite since The Witcher 3. I know Cyberpunk has issues, but it is already close to reaching something great. With more time, it will reach its potential, and hopefully it will live up to your expectations. And please, be nice to each other. Because if we're not, in 56 years time, we could all be living in our own version of Night City.